In today's video, we're going to talk about the most important strategy that you need for the MCAT and every test you'll take following the MCAT. And at IFD, we call that simplifying the question stem. We've made videos on this before in the past, but I want to spend a little extra time kind of expounding upon what we're talking about and giving you some details and like a behind the scenes view into what I'm thinking whenever I'm working through passages like an RAAMC passage breakdown strategies course and things of that nature. For those of you that don't know me, my name is John. I'm a fourth year medical student. I have match day in about a month. So we'll see what type of doctor I'm going to be. And before medical school, I worked for one of the big national MCAT companies, tutored hundreds of students, worked on some of their national initiatives and things of the nature. Took the MCAT four times myself before I finally figured out how to do it, scored in the 90th percentile, decided I wasn't satisfied working in that company, came back to medical school and started this YouTube channel and the associated business with my little sister and my business partner Maggie who's a third year medical student. We make these videos because we think that everybody should have the ability to have some professional MCAT tutor interaction so that the MCAT doesn't become like a pay to play type thing. And it's our hope that these free YouTube videos, our free courses online are all that you'll need but if you're the type of person that realizes that you're really ready to get serious about this thing and you know that you need some paid resources that you would look to us first since we gave you away so much for free. So that's what we're doing. We're trying to make more of our colleagues in the future. But today we're talking about simplifying the question stem. So what does that actually mean? So simplifying the question stem is the process of wording the question stem in a fashion that your answer to that question is the answer to the actual question on the test. Now what does that mean? Now let me talk to you about a mistake that a lot of students that whenever I was personally tutoring would make. I would tell them, hey, we have to simplify the question stem. And what they would frequently do is they would just kind of like rephrase it. If you remember in the eighth grade, whenever you were trying to not get caught for plagiarism, you would just kind of like change some of the words around and things of that nature. That's kind of like rephrasing the question stem. And that's not very helpful. You know, the whole goal of everything that you're doing is not just to build a system around things. And that that's helpful in its own right. But really, everything that you're doing on the MCAT should be helpful it should be forward progress because there's not a lot of time there's not a lot of extra time on this test and I know for a student like myself even when I did really well on it time was something that I struggled with and so the purpose of simplifying the question stem is to phrase it and frame it in a light that the question is easy and it's the actual question that they're asking not this wordy crap that you actually read on the test so how do we do that? So step one is figuring out what they're actually asking you. And to do that, you need to first identify, are they asking me about a science? Or are they asking me about some kind of like passage knowledge or graph knowledge or relationship or something like that? So science or passage figure stuff. Now once you do that, you really have to start chasing it from there. So one of the things that I think takes students a minute to realize, but you'll see me do it a lot if you get the AAMC strategies course, is whenever we simplify questions, you have to chase it a little bit. It's not an automatic, I read a question and then I say, oh, well this is actually asking what is X, Y, Z. That's, that's not how it works. A lot of times you have to simplify the questions two or three times before you actually get to a bare bones science question. And that's the goal. We want the questions to look like something you would take on one of your undergraduate tests, not an MCAT question. And I'll show you examples of how this works, so don't worry about that. But I wanna encourage you to actually take your time whenever you're doing these practice questions and really focus on improving at this specific strategy. Because if you don't, and you hope that you can passively practice it, you're not gonna get any better at it. You have to be very intentional about this. So chase a question, don't set a timer, just say, all right, I'm gonna take these five questions and I'm not going to leave this question until I am done simplifying it to an undergraduate level science. If you can simplify it to a basic science, you can get the question right, or you've realized your content gap. And that happens to me a lot. You know, I'll simplify a question, even in med school, like I would simplify a question all the way down to basically like, okay, well, which of the, you know, they may give me this long vignette of a patient's history and chief complaint and all that type stuff and some of their labs and things of that nature. And you simplify the question all the way down to which of these is the best treatment for heart failure. And then I may not know the best treatment for heart failure, but you can simplify it down to the actual question. And then it's really easy to improve upon that because you, now you know, oh, my content gap is actually that I don't know the best treatment for heart failure. Simplifying the question is really good at helping you pinpoint when you're not 100% confident in a science. Because I know that whenever you're taking these questions and the fastest way to study is to use your questions as some form or fashion of content review, right? It's not, taking questions is not just to like 
realize and engage where you are. That's a, that's a really silly way to approach it. They take too long to use them as a simple measuring stick. They should be helping with some of your content review. Sometimes you get questions right that you were like 60% confident on or that you kind of guessed right. And it's really hard to review those questions whenever they've got a green check mark beside them. But if you're simplifying them in this fashion and you realize, oh, I think the correct treatment for heart failure is X, Y, and Z. That's not a good example because there's like four drugs you put them on. But I think that glutamate is an acidic amino acid, but I'm really not sure. You'll probably guess that question right but it would still be important that you go back and review that and refresh it and make a flashcard because you weren't 100% confident on it. And that second guessing can cost you, you know, 10 seconds, 20, 30 seconds on a question. And that adds up whenever it's such a time limited exam. So step one is identifying like the question type, what, what it's asking, science versus passage type information. Step two is going to be to chase it, meaning to rephrase it several times until you have it boiled down to a basic science and an undergraduate question. And then step three is to put it all together. So make it into one coherent question. So let's take a look at some examples and I'll show you what this looks like. So what you're looking at here, this is UWorld's free, like little seven day free trial. UWorld's obviously excellent. This is the only partnership that we have accepted. And that's because I think that they make the best practice questions. They don't make practice tests, but they definitely have the best section bank, right? This is not associated with our UWorld XIFD High Yield course where you get Maggie and myself teaching you the lectures and the, the basic sciences and the strategies and how to use Anki and stuff like that. And then we pair it with UWorld um, where Maggie and I have gone through and hand selected the questions that correspond with our chapters. This is just their free trial. So anybody can get access to this for seven days. I encourage you to because it's a great resource. But that's enough of me hyping up one of our partners. I love you, world. They're great. Question number one. So let's rephrase this one. So this is a simple one. It says, which compound has the bond with the smallest dipole moment? Okay, so that's the question that they give you. So what do we say step one was? Figure out is this a science question or some kind of like passage figure interpretation type stuff. Now, your brain may say, well, this is a standalone question, so it has to be science. That's not necessarily true. Sometimes you'll get standalone questions that just want you to reason within the question. I'll see if I can find one of those. This question specifically is asking you about a science. So what is that science? Dipole moment, right? What is a small dipole moment? Okay, now most people would stop their simplification right there, but I don't think that's the best approach. So what you have to end up doing is saying, okay, well, where have I heard dipole moment before? What is this usually discussed in context with? And then hopefully your brain goes to polarity, right? So you can either say, where have I heard this discussed? What have I heard this contributed to? Really, you're just looking for anywhere in your brain that dipole moment is related to. Usually it's a high yield science, like polarity would be a high yield science. That would be in our book, in our courses. Now the MCAT is actually testing you on a high yield science of polarity, but they're doing it by bringing up this like little low yield throwaway thing that's gonna be in every book. Every description of polarity is gonna discuss dipole moment, but it's gonna be very brief, right? And this is the way that the MCAT tests questions. So, okay, we see this and we say, okay, well, dipole moment is related to polarity. And the next thing you just have to say is, okay, is it, Inverse or is it directly related? Meaning does a big dipole moment mean large polarity or vice versa? The correct answer to that is that um, they're kind of, their relationship's pretty direct, okay? So now this is saying which of these has the smallest polarity or you can rephrase this as which of these uh, compounds has the least polar bonds. So that's how I would simplify this question. Now it's a lot easier question, right? You can just go to your periodic table and you can look for the one that's gonna end up being the least polar and then you can hear your RCD and then you can guess it. So your world does a great job explaining why it's the least polar, basically has the smallest electronegativity. And then they're gonna explain to you about uh, how dipoles are related to polarity and things of that nature. That's how you simplify a question. And if this question said, which of these is the least polar, I guarantee you the majority of people would not, or yeah, 21% of people would not have picked water, right? Because water is a known polar molecule. But the difficulty in this question is getting from dipole moment to polarity. And that's where simplifying the question just makes this so much easier and so much faster. So let's look for some more. Okay, that question's pretty straightforward. All right, this is a good one. So this is a good one that like, kind of like I was discussing, some questions are asking you to reason within the passage, some within the question themselves, and some on sciences. So step one is figuring out which question this is. So it says, the student adds a few drops of bromethylol blue. We'll call this bro blue because I think that's funny. 
BKF 7.1 is an indicator to determine the amount of titratable acid in 25 mils of urine according to Folin's method. What effect will the bromethylin, bro, will the bro blue have on the pH of the urine sample? Okay, so is this asking about sciences or passage stuff or slash question stuff? Your brain may want to jump to sciences because your brain is going to want to always jump to sciences. But this is saying what effect does this bro blue have on a pH? Well, my first question is what is bro blue, right? Well, it tells us that bro blue is an indicator. Okay, well, I think this is kind of asking us to just reason within the passage a little bit. Yeah, indicator is a science, but it's not really a basic science. So I think we can kind of use some of our just intuition to figure out what this is. But now we know what it is, let's chase it a little bit. The question itself is saying, what effect does this indicator have on the pH of the urine sample? Okay, let's chase. We're on step two, we're chasing. Okay, what does an indicator do? Blue, turns blue, right? It indicates that we have reached the appropriate amount of titratable acid and it turns blue. This is an experiment you, you all did in Gen Chem, right? Where you have an indicator in this little beaker, you slowly add some acid or a base until it changes color. I think ours was usually like pink or something like that is what we use in undergrad, but still it was an indicator. So now the whole goal is to tell us when we've reached a specific pH. Right, so this question is just saying, if this is purely to tell us when we've reached a specific pH, what's it gonna do to the pH? Well, if it were good at what it did, would I want it to be changing the pH if the whole goal is for it to identify the pH? Probably not. So now I'm looking for something that's gonna say it's not gonna impact it very much, right? So A says it will substantially increase the pH of the sample. B says it'll decrease it. C says it will neutralize the sample. I guess that means bring it to seven, I'm not sure. D says it'll have little effect on the pH of the sample. So that's what I would go with. And uh, I don't know the answer to this question. I haven't prepped it or anything like that, but this is probably what I would guess. So you see all of this is super wordy. You can boil it down to what would be a good indicator? What would a good indicator do to the pH? If we wanted something to tell us when at what pH we were at, then how would that impact the pH? probably wouldn't want to impact the pH. So that's another one. Let's see if we can do one more example. Okay, so this says if the titration of H2PO4 minus in a urine sample is continued until all the acidic protons in the solution are neutralized, how many equivalents of NaOH are needed to complete the titration of the solution? Okay, kind of wordy. You kind of have an idea that you're dealing with some acid-based stuff, but let's let's do our algorithm. So step one, is this science or is this passage stuff? It's probably science, right? Okay, so what science are we discussing? We're discussing titration of acid with base. Specifically, we're discussing the titration of acids with a base. Okay, so we know that we're there. So what about the acids in the base? What's the actual question, right? The actual question is how many base equivalents do we need to neutralize the acid equivalents? In order to answer that question, you probably need to know how many acid equivalents there are, right? So that's when you look here and you see how many acid equivalents there would be. So acids are seen as the concentration of protons in a solution. Right, and so, and again, I could be wrong here, but I would rephrase this question as like, how many acid equivalents do I have? How many protons that can freely dissociate do I see in the solution? And I see two, right? And I could be wrong, but I wasn't. So this is, this big long question is literally just how many acidic protons are there? And so that's all, simplifying the question makes this really, really easy. You know, with all three of these questions, the person watching this video, you, could have gotten all these right with my simplification. You might have missed them without it, but if I said how many acidic protons are here, you would have told me two, because it literally says H2. If I had told you, do you want your measuring stick of pH to change your pH or no, you'd probably be like, no, I just want to measure, right? Good measuring stick doesn't make you taller or shorter. A good measuring stick just tells you how tall you are. And then if I'd said which of these is the least polar, you know, you probably could have pulled up the periodic table and told me. So simplifying the question works is the biggest tool in your arsenal for studying for the MCAT. And this is a little bit deeper level on the complexity. And I think the thing that I want you to primarily take away from this is that simplifying the question is not like a one done type deal. You have to keep working for it a little bit. So once you go through that algorithm, you know, what's it, is this a science question or is this like a passage logic type question? Once you identify that, the next thing you have to do is chase it a little bit and figure out what is specifically are they trying to, to ask you about. So you start here and you say, oh, this question is asking about titration. What about titration? 
What are we titrating? We're titrating a base into an acid. Okay, well, what are they asking about that specifically? Okay, we're, they're asking how many acidic protons do we need? Okay, well, how many do you need? How does that work? And then you boil it all, all the way down to, this question is asking, asking me how many protons are in this, how many acid equivalents are in it. So that's what I want you to take, is that simplifying the question is all about chasing down the exact science. And if you want a good way to practice this, you just need to take questions untimed, right? And really focus on improving on it. And then whenever you're reviewing these questions, especially if you missed it, or if you weren't confident in your simplification, you need to spend time in this review, once you realize what the science is that they're testing you on, you gotta go back to this question. You gotta reread it. You gotta say, why didn't I know that that's what they were asking? Okay, what threw me off? And now that I know that that's what they're asking, what gives it away? Because you can't keep making the same mistakes. You know, it's okay to make mistakes. You know, if I am doing a surgery on somebody and I give them, you know, a scar that I don't like, it's okay that I did that once. It sucks. I hope I don't ever do that. It's okay, but it's okay that I did that once. But it's not okay if I keep doing it, right? If I keep giving people ugly scars. So you gotta, you gotta fix your mistakes. And this is just the first of many scenarios where you'll be tasked with doing that. But thanks for watching. Please share this video with somebody you think will benefit from it. And of course, if you're needing help with your MCAT studies, and check out the links in the description whatever you are. I think that we have a lot of really unique products and we teach in a very unique fashion because we're very conversational. I mean, I literally was you four years ago and uh, Matt used you three years ago. So we know exactly what you're feeling, what you're going through and how scary and how disheartening the process is. We bring a very unique product set. We also bring a very unique teaching style to the MCAT industry. And I'm so thankful to all of you that have supported us, whether that be liking the videos, sharing them with your friends, or purchasing products so that we can keep reinvesting and making newer products and hiring on people to help make sure that somebody that has the right drive and the right heart to become a doctor has the ability and the resources to become a doctor as well. So thanks for watching. We'll see you in the next one.